Okay, so another part of global systems in energy is kind of how energy gets distributed within an ecosystem, right? In any ecosystem, there are living and non-living parts, right? And those living and non-living parts interact with each other, okay? A lot of times they interact in terms of transferring or converting energy, right? So the input energy for all systems on Earth is what? What's the source of energy that runs everything on Earth? The sun, okay? So there's only one group of organisms on Earth that can directly convert solar energy into chemical energy. What are they? Plants, yeah. Okay. They use photosynthesis. In a food chain or a food web, we call them the producers. Okay. They are the things that can produce chemical energy that sustains all the other members of the food chain or food web. Okay. Um, the animals that prey directly on the plants, okay? We call the first order consumers or primary consumers, okay? And they are the herbivores or omnivores, depending on whether they eat both or whether they just eat plants, right? So these would be things like deer and moose and cows and whatever, okay? That just eat the plants. Then we've got our secondary consumers, okay? Those are the ones that, uh, that consume the herbivores, so they're predators, okay? And then there can be predators of the predators, okay, all the way up to the food chain depending on how long it is and we talked about how in the tropical rainforest food chains can be pretty long given how many different kinds of bugs there are all right so we're going to look at a little bit more today kind of where all that energy is how some of the energy is trapped in the non-living parts and some of it is interactions between both living and non-living all right so if we have like a niche for example okay a niche is the organism's role in the environment so if you're a plant no, that's pronounced wrong. Niche is pronounced, is how the French pronounce it, okay? I'm not teaching you French immersion science. This is English science. Niche is how we say it, okay? It is niche. All right, um, so the niche is the organism's ecological role, okay? That also kind of defines how it uses not only the resources, the matter in its environment, but also the energy within its environment, All right? So if we're looking at these, like uh, the nest of these swallows, for example, okay? The nest or the niche, sorry, of these swallows is that they are essentially like omnivores, Okay, they do eat some plant material, but they do also eat like worms and bugs and things like that. Okay, so they are interacting with the energy part of their environment in that way. They are converting some of the primary, con prim or sorry, some of the producers to energy, and they are produced. They are converting some of the primary consumers to energy, and even in some cases, the decomposers into energy for themselves. Okay, what uh, the other part of their niche is that they are using certain resources in the environment. They use this place. Okay, that is the area underneath overhanging rocks to build their nests. Okay, why do they build them there? It protects them from the things that want to use them for energy. Okay, that might be things like wolves or hawks or eagles or something like that. Having your nest kind of tucked away in an overhanging rock protects it fairly well from most predators. Okay, even like eagles and hawks would have a hard time getting at those nests. Okay, without just kind of flying in and just breaking them and hoping the eggs would fall to the ground. If they do that, obviously the eggs break and they you know, may not get as much nutritional value out of it. All right, so they're, that's how they're kind of using their uh, role or performing their role. All right, um, their habitat is where do they live? Well, these particular nests are actually tucked right in here underneath this overhang of rock okay, next to that bridge. Right? So their habitat is that whole area. Okay. It happens to be in the grassland biome okay, or the prairie biome um, where there's you know, noticeable winters, hot, dry summers, okay, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, that's where they live. Okay, and so they need the resources and energy that are available in that particular place. Everybody all right with that? Yeah. All right. Now, if we have two similar organisms, okay, they could occupy the same niche. Is that a problem? It is, okay? It means if you occupy the same niche, you need the same resources. There's only so many resources to go around. If there's only so many resources to go around, there's going to be competition. Okay? There's two different kinds of competition. There's interspecific competition, which means hawks versus falcons. 
okay? So they're not the same species, but are competing for the same resources. And there's intraspecific competition, that is competition between all of the hawks, okay? So competition within members of your own species, because obviously all the hawks need the same resources, right? So there's different types of competition, right? That competition is essentially there to kind of weed out the weak. That's how natural selection works, okay? If you are not one of the strongest hawks in this particular habitat, you will probably starve, okay? Which means your genetic material doesn't get passed on to the next generation, which in the grand scheme of things is a good thing. You weren't strong enough to survive. Therefore, your offspring also probably wouldn't have been strong enough to survive. Nature's kind of harsh that way, okay? Um, but that's the way it works. All right, so organisms will have to compete for the available resources. So hawks and falcons often live in the same area, occupy the same niche. That is the role of the top carnivore, okay? The size of their population is determined by how well each species and individual organisms competes for the resources, all right? So if a hawk has a particularly good perch, okay, it's going to see more of the rodents that it is trying to capture, more gophers, more mice, and things like that, okay? So it will do better. Now, the other organisms in its environment would recognize that that perch is the best place to be. Would they even compete for that perch? You ever see birds fighting in midair? Okay. That's what they're doing. They're competing for not just resources okay, in, the, in terms of energy, but resources in terms of space as well. Okay. That area allows me to get more of the food resources. I want to be there, and I'll fight you for it. Okay. And that's kind of what goes on. All right, so more of this stuff. Uh, or vari the variation between all hawks means that some hawks are gonna be better equipped than others to survive. Obviously, not all organisms are, are exactly the same. Okay, we look around this room, we can see that we are all quite different from each other. Yes, we have the same general characteristics, but okay, when it comes right down to it, you know, there's something about each one of us that's different from somebody else in the room, okay? In nature, those differences can mean the difference between how well you compete for resources or not okay so if you are um, a hawk that is particularly strong particularly large okay maybe you have really dense feathers that allows you to glide and fly better than other hawks you are going to compete better for your resources than a hawk that has like skinny not dense feathers and doesn't fly very well all right that's going to make it more difficult for them to hunt okay and in terms of for a lot of birds, mating rituals, that could also be important, okay? For lots of birds, okay, the whole mating ritual is like this big dance where the male shows all their plumage. That's feathers, okay? And they dance around, like, especially peacocks. Peacocks are really big for that, okay? They fan out the big tail, okay? And the more impressive and colorful your tail is, the more you get to mate. That's really weird, but that's how it works, okay? Um, so, okay, all of these things are factors that influence how well you do within your niche. All right, so if we are talking about interspecific competition, I mentioned that in the last slide here, that's falcons versus hawks, okay? That's competition between members of different species, okay? There's intraspecific if you are um, competing against members of your own species, okay? All right, um, so what would happen if year after year, the hawks were doing better than the falcons? Yeah, well, maybe not extinct, but they would certainly disappear from this area, okay? Their numbers would dwindle because if they're not healthy, they're not reproducing as much and they're not producing as many offspring, okay? They can't feed their offspring, so they, their numbers would dwindle and the hawks would eventually just take over, right? And we see that in the fossil record. There's lots of instances through the fossil record where an animal or a group of animals has not done very, you know, has done well, done well, and then all of a sudden they kind of disappear, Okay? and something else has replaced them. So okay, we see that happen throughout. Okay? That's when you know, if it's, uh, you know, a species could go extinct or be extirpated, that means removed from that particular area. Okay. Uh, so what adaptations or variations might be valuable? Well, we already talked about feathers, plumage. Okay? What else could be valuable? Yeah, their talons, the ability to grip things, okay? Like if you've got really strong talons, you can grip and hold larger or more prey, okay? Eyesight's huge for birds, okay? From that height, being able to detect the motion of something very small on the ground and then dive to catch it, okay? Eyesight's very important. Yes, 
yeah, how how many legs or how many legs? How many eggs can you lay? Okay, yeah, if you're if you're producing more eggs, that can be good, but the downside of that is can you feed them all, right? So how well do you take care of your offspring is also, yeah, that's definitely a characteristic. Okay. If you look at organisms that don't kind of rear their young, they just kind of lay eggs and wander off and hope the eggs do well. Okay, they they typically have a lower percentage of survival. Okay, of offspring than do uh, organisms that actually care for their young. Okay, now organisms that care for their young also tend to have less of them, right? But more of them survive. So. Yes. Yeah, how strong their beak is, or how strong their talons, because it's made out of the same things. Okay, if you have, uh, you know, that that being very strong, then that means you waste a lot less of your food. Right, you might just actually crunch down and break the bones of your of your prey and eat the whole thing. Right, so then you get your calcium and all that kind of stuff as well. All right, well, that's good. Those are all good ideas. All right, so competition within a species that's intraspecific. Okay, so if you got uh, two bears, okay competing for a spot on the river where they're catching salmon. That would be intraspecific competition, okay? Or they're fighting over a hillside covered in berries that they're going to eat, okay? That would be intraspecific competition, right? And that can be actually tougher than competition against members of another species. Usually, when we're talking about two different species, there's, a, there's yes, a lot of overlap, but there's usually part of the area that's not overlapped that they can always go to as kind of a backup. You know, hawks won't do this, but falcons will, okay? And it's typically, like, hawks generally don't go after really small rodents, but falcons can, okay? And so there's that area where there's no overlap, okay? But if we're talking about two bears, they're entirely overlapped. They need exactly the same resources. So this can be tougher okay, on, on animals and plants. Okay? Plants do this as well. Okay? Plants exhibit all kinds of you know, intraspecific and interspecific competition. If you're a plant, you want to grow big, like tall, as well as wide. Right? That way you capture more sunlight and you shade out your competition, kill them off. Okay? Uh, we talked about how spruce trees drop their needles and they make the soil acidic around them so nothing else can grow and steal the nutrients from the soil around them. Okay? All of those are examples of competition between plants. Okay? You might not think about you know, plants don't move, plants don't do whatever, but they still compete. Okay? These are ways that they compete for resources with each other. Okay. Um, Okay, so like we said, with plants, okay, the same processes can occur. Okay, what variations might be present uh, in these plants and what would they be competing for? All right, so we've got like patches of bare ground between these clumps of grass. All right, so um, what's, what are some variations between these, these plants that might be important for them? Okay, how fast they can grow their roots. Okay, what else? Yeah, exactly. How much, how wide can they grow? And even more than that, how wide do their roots go? Not just how fast can they grow their roots, but how wide. You'll notice there's space in between these plants. That means that seeds that fell there weren't successful. This plant was already established there and was taking all of the moisture. So anything that was small and tried to grow there didn't succeed and died. Right? So that's why you see the spacing. Okay? They space themselves kind of naturally in order to make sure that the resources are available for all of them. Okay. All right. What about um, ability to pr produce seeds? Could that be an important variation? Right. Like most plants, either have a flower or something that produces some seeds, and then those seeds are distributed. Okay. If you can produce more seeds, you are going to pass on your genes more often than the others. Okay. All right. So they could be competing for. I would say, looking at the ground here, mostly the competition would be for water. Okay. Is there much competition for light here? No, they're not overlapping each other, so they're really light's not really a factor. Okay, they're not competing for light, but they're certainly competing for water, nutrients to do with water. Okay, but in terms of light, none of them are tall enough and trying to shade the others. Okay, so this would be mostly competition for water. All right, so in any community, organisms depend on each other for survival, and that can come in a number of relationships. Okay, uh, so we classify those relationships based on who benefits from the reaction, okay? Obviously, if you're a deer and you get eaten by a bear, you didn't benefit from that. Bear did, okay? 
but as the deer, you did not. All right. So the most familiar interactions are one in which an organism or predator benefits while the prey does not. Okay. That's predation. So this tiger eating that wildebeest. Okay. Or a cow eating grass. Okay. The grass does not really benefit from being eaten okay, by the cow. I mean, slowly it grows back and it'll grow back a little more dense, but immediately there's no benefit to the grass. It got destroyed and had to grow back. And that involves the, you know, the use of a lot of its resources. Okay. So any type of predation, only the predator wins in that regard. Okay. Um, parasitism. Right? Parasitism is when one organism lives off another without killing it most of the time. Sometimes it will. Okay. But at only the parasite's advantage, this will actually end up hurting the thing being parasitized. Okay. So um, athlete's foot. Okay. If you have athlete's foot, okay, that is a fungus that grows on your skin. Okay. The fungus benefits from you. You do not benefit from the fungus. It is actually destroying and eating your cells. That's why it's itchy. Okay. So that is a parasite that lives on you. Okay. And you, you have no advantage. Okay. In fact, in the long run, it isn't good. It's, it hurts you. All right. Um, so in parasitism, one organism, the parasite lives off the other at the host's expense. Okay. So the thing being parasitized is called the host. All right. So if I, you know, drink some water that's not purified and I get some kind of like tapeworm or something like that. Okay. The tapeworm is a parasite on the host and I don't benefit from that unless of course I was lose, looking to lose a massive amount of weight. Okay. In which case that would be a side benefit, but not really. Okay. I would, I've heard that, that they'll yeah, intentionally actually. infect themselves with, with tapeworms in order to lose weight. That is not smart. Okay. Do not. That's gross too. Okay. Don't do those kinds of things. You have to be happy with who you are. Okay. Like, yeah, don't do that. Yes. All right. Um, there's another, there's another, there's other forms like there's yes. Examples of one organism living off another as a parasite. Okay. Parasitism is a form of symbiosis. That's an association between members of different species. Now, okay. There's parasit parasitism. And then there's examples like mutualism where they both get some kind of advantage. Okay. So in mutualism, okay. They both organisms benefit and actually depend on each other. Okay? And then there's commensalism where one organism benefits, but the other, it doesn't matter to them one way or the other. Right? So if we have like, um, this is a lichen. Okay? A lichen is a fungus and a um, algae living together. All right? So they work together okay? and um, the, the algae can carry out photosynthesis and make food. Okay. The fungus can help break down and get nutrients from other places. So uh, if they work together, do they both benefit from that? Sure they do. Okay. They both get something out of it. Okay. Whereas in this relationship, this bird lives on the back of the rhino and basically eats lice. Okay. It just pecks and eats the lice off the back of the rhino. It just pecks them. You'll see it just pecking away and eating bugs and other things and lice and stuff off the back of the rhinoceros. Right. That doesn't really benefit the rhinoceros very much. Okay. And the lice are not going to hurt it. Okay. They make it itchy, but really, I mean, other than that, it's not going to hurt it too much. Okay. But certainly the bird gets something out of that. Right. So that's not mutualism. That's commensalism. Those trees suck out all the nutrients out of like the trees around them. Right. Yes. Yes. They, well, to an extent, it does make the other ones weaker. So yeah. that's still true parasitism. Yeah. All right. Uh, so if we're looking kind of at a food chain or a food web here, okay, looking at an ecosystem, right? We talked about how in uh, the biology unit, there's like biotic and abiotic components. Okay. So we would have in this ecosystem, the abiotic components being the sun, the source of energy for the environment. Okay. It is causing the producers that would be algae and plants and, and things like that, aquatic plants as well okay, uh, to thrive. And then there would be our primary consumers that would be small, like zooplankton or something like that, that can eat those. And then there'd be uh, small fish that would be our secondary consumer eating the zoo zooplankton and then larger, like, I don't know if that's like a walleye or something, okay, eating the small perch, right? Uh, so a tertiary consumer eating the smaller fish, right? And then obviously any 
dead material would sink to the bottom okay, and that would be decomposed and that those are important organisms as well as they help to return some of those nutrients okay, back to the environment afterwards. All right, I want you guys to answer those four questions. Okay, right, maybe, you know, a couple of sentences for each one. Give you a few minutes and then we'll go over those together. So, what's a moose's niche? What role does it play in its ecosystem or environment? Okay, it's a herbivore, okay, which means that it is converting the uh, plant material, the producers, into um, usable energy for itself. Okay, other resources that it might use, okay, it might use some space. Okay, a moose is a fairly large animal. It would be needing some uh, fairly significant chunks of, of land for grazing, right, using its resources in that way. Um, and then it would also be a home to, like, small insects like lice and ticks and other things like that. Okay, that's also its role. It has to feed other organisms, including it could be food for bears mostly. It's hard to imagine anything other than maybe a pack of wolves taking down a moose. They're a pretty big animal. All right, a grass, its niche would be that it is a producer. Yeah, it is con directly converting solar energy into chemical energy and it is going to be preyed upon by every herbivore in that environment. But it is also likely to be one of the most numerous um, organisms in its environment. Okay, you'll, you'll tend to see that numbers dwindle by at least a factor of 10 okay, in every level of the food chain. Okay? It's generally called the 10% the rule. Okay? So um, if I have 100 moose, I can have only like 10 times less than that okay, of their predator because only 10% of the energy actually gets through from each level. All right, give three examples of each kind of relationship listed in this lesson. So predators, okay, you list anything that eats another organism, including a moose eating grass, okay, a uh, bear eating salmon, uh, or um, let's say a bird eating a worm, right? Those would be predator relationships. Okay, if we are talking about... Um, parasitism, then we could have like a tapeworm in the stomach of a moose. Uh, we could have um, like, let's say ticks eating the blood from something else. Um, that would make them a parasite. Okay. Um, basically anything that's going to live on another organism, including fungus. Okay. Uh, growing on the skin of an organism. All right. Uh, and then mutualism. Okay, mutualism is a little bit harder okay, to, to come by, but um, you know we can probably think of a few examples of each kind of, of mutualism. The ones we had in there okay, um, were the um, the lichen okay, that was working together, right? Uh, things like that, uh, and then commensalism, anything that's going to eat bugs off of something else. You know that doesn't really hurt the animal the bugs are on, but it certainly benefits the animal eating the bugs. Oh yeah, there's yeah, there's like a lamprey of some kind that, or it's not exactly a lamprey, but it's like that, and it cleans like, um, what do they call them, barnacles and stuff, yeah, off the side. That would be commensalism. It doesn't really hurt the, the shark to have the barnacles, but it's certainly an advantage for the fish that eats them. Okay, two sharks are fighting over a seal carcass. What kind of competition is that? But it's two sharks. Yeah, oh, so it'd be intra specific because they're assuming they're the same species. I didn't specifically say one was a tiger shark and one was a great white. Okay. I'm assuming they're both the same species. Okay. If I had said one tiger shark and one uh, great white shark, then yes, that would be inter specific competition. All right. We'll leave it at that. <laughs>